Welcome to Fuller Speed Ahead. I'm Craig Fuller. Actually, a very special show today. I have with me my father, Max. So we have two Fullers. This is Fuller's Speed Ahead. Uh, so, Dad, welcome to our show. Thanks, Craig. I'm very delighted to be here. Yeah, so a little bit about your background. You founded U.S. Express in 1985, um, had been very active both in entrepreneurship of starting companies around the industry, around trucking, but have also built U.S. Express to be one of the largest trucking companies in the U.S. That's true, and, and building U.S. Express has been, been a lot of fun over the years. Uh, we're able to take technology ahead of most people in the industry and really capitalize on it. And, and I think we as a company have really changed our industry uh, through, through the years. How do you think you, U.S. Express and you have changed the industry? Well, you know, one is adopting a lot of technologies early. Uh, we found a lot of technologies in Europe that uh, over the years, I'd go to Europe, find technologies, come back and kind of push the, the truck OEs to adopt those technologies into their trucks. And we, in a lot of cases, were the first to do that. You know, a couple, couple examples, uh, AMT transmissions, we were the first. We found it in uh, Eaton Skunk Works, and I'd seen it probably five or six years before. Uh, I was there, there for dinner one night at their lodge, and, and I asked them about it, and they said, we haven't figured out how to deploy that into, into the truckload market. And I said, I'd like to see it. We went out the next day, uh, looked at uh, actually uh, on the proven ground, tested the, the product, really liked it. And I said, well, I don't care what you're doing with other people, I, w I want that product. So AMT is the automatic, assisted automatic transmissions? That's that's right. So, in, and Yospress was one of the first fleets in the United States to actually the, implement the, that technology? Probably the first to implement it and probably the first to get to the uh, fully automated uh, transmissions. And the advantages for fleets is fuel economy, safety, does it help on recruiting? It helps on recruiting. If you look at uh, drivers today, there is a difference in the type of drivers that we're attracting. You know, a lot of them have never driven uh, vehicles that with, say, manual transmissions. So they really don't understand how to deal with it. You know, like people say 20, 30 years ago. Uh, today, you know, that's, that makes a big difference though. So the 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 industry percent of the industry in your estimates that are automated versus manual is it still predominantly a manual transmission industry? Or? In talking to the Daimler people, they said almost ninety percent were uh, automated manual transmissions today. So it's completely in flipped in terms of that. It's flipped, but uh, keep in mind, I've been doing this for almost twenty years. Right. You know, so we were out there probably two or three years ahead of anyone else. You know, as they were trying to perfect the product. Uh, so we had had a lot of uh, initial early failures uh, of the product because it really hadn't been been hardened hard and tested. Now, one the of market. the things that, as a reputation that, and I've known this because I grew up mm -hmm. obviously as a as a kid in your house, as my father, but you have a reputation of being both on the leading edge and at times on the bleeding edge of technology. Um, a lot of experimentation uh, in the early phases. Uh, and really doing innovation before innovation was cool. And I'm wondering right. how, how do you think about that has given you guys the ability to sort of scale up the business faster than you can competition, but also some, where are some of the mistakes you made along the way? I'll probably attack it two ways. One is uh, we were very early on with the Qualcomm satellite communications. Uh, we started a company in, in late 1985 in 1987, uh, Qualcomm was about the only player in the market. Uh, cellular really hadn't taken off at that point, and we we're probably the third large company to adopt the, the Qualcomm system. Uh, over a period of two or three years, we uh, started developing uh, the, the system into, back then was the IBM 38 system, which was a, a great database machine and we, we basically built a system around the communications. Uh, Qualcomm saw what we did, came in and bought, uh, bought and bartered uh, for a lot of the software that we did. So we helped set those standards, but we also deployed probably a good 10 years ahead of most of the industry and most of our customers over a period of time basically were forcing, I mean totally forcing other carriers to adopt it. Uh, we did things like in 1985, it was very common 
to pick up a load going coast to coast. Now, keep in mind, my dad was one of the first people to run two trucks with, uh, or run a truck with two drivers uh, coast to coast as they were building the interstates in the late 50s and early 60s. Now, rumor has it that he did that to uh, get away from the, our, the, the ICC and keep things running. Is that well? It really, the truth? Did, no. It really wasn't to circumvent the ICC. It, it was basically to uh, expedite, expedite freight from one coast to another. Was U.S. Express and also my stepbrother's company, Covenant, uh, came into existence since my dad had built a legacy of running into Southern California and picking up products coming back east. Um, that's where both companies really cut cut their teeth at. Is it fair to say because Chattanooga now, Steve Case said it, Silicon Valley of trucking. Uh, certainly, has been a lot of innovation here, uh, a lot of energy around freight innovation in Chattanooga. Is it fair to say that the the fact that the carpet industry is in Dalton is in many ways with with your dad, my grandfather, was really what sort of kicked off the tribal uh, knowledge and experience in this community? Uh, but is it really related to carpet, or is there something more fundamental to it? Well, I think it's a little bit more fundamental. If you go back and look at Chattanooga over the ages, you know, it's it's been known as a transportation town. And, in the turn of the century, it was the, the railroads that basically were so critical, and Chattanooga was a, almost an intersect point of a bunch of rail lines. You know, and if you look at, say, starting in, in about the 1970s, the interstate system basically did the same thing. It took a lot of freight off the rails, but it put them on trucks. And Chattanooga being such a central point to the eastern half of the nation uh, became real valued in being, being almost a center point of transportation in this country. Now, Clyde is a, one of the godfathers of trucking. You've got uh, really four sort of core founders in trucking that really kicked off long haul or, or what's now the mm -hmm. four hire market. Clyde is certainly one of those godfathers. You followed in his footsteps. I'm wondering, when you went out and started US Express, um, how did your relationship with your dad uh, really influence the success of that business? It really made it tough, because uh, if, if you look at uh, what happened, my dad sold his company, and then that's the reason my and stepbrother- which was Southwest Motor Freight. Southwest Motor Freight. Uh, he sold it to an investment group out in New Jersey, and we, between David Parker and myself, we worked for the guy for about seven months and saw that he was taking the company in a totally different direction than we, we felt like it needed to go. There was, there's things that we weren't comfortable with he ended up serving uh, prison time. Right? He ended up serving prison time. Yeah. We could have been in there with him if we stayed with the company. And, yeah, he embezzled and, a bunch of money. And yeah, that's the reason we left. Else. Yeah. Uh, and when we left, we basically, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, my dad sold the company to him, but but all the equity in the company was in equipment. And equipment was supposed to be sold over, over about a two year period. So they set up a general partnership which I was the general partner that owned all the equipment. So the day I left, we started a, a whole roller coaster of events. And I controlled his fleet, but yet I, I couldn't run trucks because I had a non compete. You had a non compete. You yeah. own all the, the debt and the assets were in your name. Uh, it's still in the company's name, but is all encumbered <clears throat> by my dad. And since, since I had the general partnership, I controlled where that went to. So so we sit down and uh, went through the numbers and I could have walked away about five million bucks, but we bankrupted Southwest Motor Freight, which wouldn't have been the right thing. You know, so I've always thought about doing the right thing, even if it hurts. And that one kind of hurt because I could walk away with millions. And my dad basically said, don't do it. You know, and even though I had the power to do it, I didn't. Don't bankrupt it. Don't Your bankrupt dad advised it. you not right. to bankrupt the company. Yeah, so so we didn't bankrupt the company. We did the right thing. The guy had given given David and I a hundred thousand dollars a piece worth of stock. So when we left, he basically bought it back for a hundred thousand, and that's the hundred thousand that Covenant started with, and and I had a partner, also. So he he had a hundred thousand. I had a hundred thousand. So. That's what started US Express and Covenant. So 300,000 between the three of you guys. But if I remember right, you actually started a company called USA Leasing. 
It right. was David Parker, Pat Quinn, and, and Max, yourself, right. all involved in this partnership. But And I was young. I was six years old, so yeah. I don't remember the details very well. But I remember there was the idea that you guys were a leasing company, and then what came of that leasing company somehow became U.S. President Covenant. What happened that actually... There's a lot more that? to that story. We'd love to hear it. So, so when my dad sold Southwest, he still owned a company called Countrywide Truck Service based out of Southern California. Uh, we had bought Countrywide because they had a great terminal in Pomona. We needed a bigger terminal. Countrywide really had a terminal that was too expensive for them. Keep in mind, this How is How many when, trucks did Countrywide have? At that point, I don't remember. Probably a couple, 300. Okay, so it was decent. You know, I mean, those days, was a, that was a that, really big carrier. That was a decent-sized yeah. company. You know, Southwest at the time probably had just a few, few under 1,000. So we really needed a bigger facility. So we bought Countrywide with the idea that we would uh, spin Countrywide off as a separate company. Well, as, as uh, my dad kept getting deeper and deeper into Countrywide after we moved them away from the terminal, and uh, it became pretty successful. So, so in the process, he- what, what became successful? Countrywide. Countrywide, so, so make sure I understand. You had, do you guys own Countrywide at this point? My dad owned Countrywide. Your, your dad owns Countrywide. And he owns Southwest Motor Freight. And Southwest Motor Freight. And this is before Bill Phil, the, the investment right. guy, takes over. Okay, mm -hmm. so there's a, so Countrywide and Southwest are separate companies, both owned by your father. Right. By Clyde. So where are we at in terms of the year? Was it 1980? Probably 1984, okay. somewhere around so there. So 84, and then he sells Southwest Motor Freight. Well, he sold Southwest Motor Freight to the investment group out in New Jersey. Okay. The guy that was leading the group had been the CFO at Penske Corp. Okay. And, of course, he, he was selling it. And I met Roger about that point, too. Roger came in, looked at the company, kind of liked it, wanted to do a deal. He just completed a deal with RCA to buy Hertz just, oh, wow. just okay. a few years before. So uh, what we were told was that Roger wasn't ready to step in. But this investment group was going to step in and take over, and eventually Roger would, would take the company. Now, does Clyde still own Countrywide at this point? He still owns Countrywide. So Countrywide's okay. running. Clyde owns that outright. Yeah. You've got this investment firm come in with a guy named Bill Phil. He led it. And mm -hmm. you're working for Bill Phil at this point. I'm working for Bill so Phil. So is Pat, and so is David Parker. Yeah. So, so we leave uh, seven months in. So you leave Southwest Motor Freight. Guys embezzling money, checks are starting to bounce. You're mm -hmm. out. We, we decided not to be a part of it, so Got we're it. out. So seven months in, you're like, okay. peace, we're out, and then what happens? So, so we have this general partnership where I'm selling equipment and giving my dad the equity out of the trucks, um, which, which is probably only fair. And so we're trying to figure out what we're going to do. So the three of us were going out looking at companies, saying, okay, maybe we'll pull them into Chattanooga. And then one afternoon, I come up with a wild idea. Well, my dad still owns Countrywide. Let's go buy Countrywide. Now, the leasing company, the USA leasing that you're talking about, we had taken 50 trucks and leased two Countrywide as owner operators, as, kind of as a sideline. You know, my dad let us do it and it helped build, build Countrywide. And, and it was off balance sheet for him, so it made it a lot easier. Uh, so, so it's a win win. And basically, the guy is trying to finance trucks as they're in the middle of a deal. Okay. Okay, and so since no one would finance him because he's not there yet, my dad didn't want to do it, so they created a partnership called Lookout Leasing, uh, which we bought 25 trucks and leased back to Southwest Motor Freight. He's got Countrywide, he's running that on the side. Still has Countrywide. S has brought an investment group for Southwest, the much bigger operator, but a thousand right. trucks. You're working for Southwest. Right. You, David Parker and Pat are working as, as principals of Southwest. Right. And the investment firm comes in, what happens? Investment firm comes in and the world changes almost overnight. Company's pretty successful, but then we go through about uh, Six and a half months in, checks are bouncing. Uh, we find that uh, the company is is making good money, but yet the money's not in in the account. Uh, it appears like some of the money ended up in in an account in New Jersey, which is not a, one of the company accounts, as far as I remember. Okay. Okay, but uh, 
Uh, so we decided to leave. Okay, when we left, we, uh, we were looking at companies to, to go buy and bring in to Chattanooga uh, and finally decided that wasn't going to be the right answer. So I come up with the idea one afternoon, my dad still owns Countrywide, let's go buy Countrywide. So I called my dad, make, kind of make a handshake deal with him. If I can do so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, will you sell me the company? And he says, yes. So, so uh, I get on the plane and go to Baltimore, meet with a guy named Bill Legg with Alex Brown, and a guy named John Larkin. <laughs> John was, was the underling to Bill Legg at that point. So, uh, so that's my first meeting with uh, Larkin. Um, and Larkin's young. He's in he, his he, he, he was young 20s at, that point. Maybe at this point. Uh, probably. And you're in your t what? Uh, no, I'm, I'm probably in my late twenties. Yeah, same you're, time. you're 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 so you're so I'm pushing the envelope on on all ends. But I convinced them that if they can take the company public, then the countrywide public, countrywide public, then I use the the public vehicle as a way to get control of countrywide. Okay. Okay. So we have a deal that that looks like it's going to work. So so we start down the road to put, put all the pieces together. I get a contract from my dad. Uh, so I've got a specified price that I'm paying. And then uh, Alex Brown says, it's a long shot, but we can pull it off. So, so we start the process. Well, the guy that bought my dad's company, Southwest Motor Freight, Bill Phil, Bill Phil he hears that we're working on this. So he comes in and gives a $10 million deposit to buy uh, Countrywide at double the price we offer. Okay, so so my dad calls and I can tell there was something wrong. And I said, well, what, what's the issue? And he says, well, I've got a $10 million deposit for a price twice yours. And I said, well, if that's the case, we, we're wasting our time. So I told him, rip up the contract, take, take the 10 million and take the double price now, because, you, because there's no way I can touch that. Did you no, feel betrayed by your no. dad? No, the only only place I might have felt a little bit of betrayal was in building Southwest. He, he, you know, his motivation to get us work so many hours and work cheap was this company will be here someday. Ah. And then when he sold it, it, you know, and that's part of the process to sell the company. So, so you know, I can't can't really be be upset at him. But you know, I'm sitting there after after Southwest sold and now Countrywide's out of our hands. Uh, what do we do? And so, this is 1985, 84, 85? Early 1985. Okay, so 85, I'm six years old. Mm -hmm. You're, you've left your dad's company, Southwest. You've made this offer to buy Countrywide. Clyde decides to do what? Does he end up doing the, the Bill Phil deal? Bill Phil, he gave, Bill Phil gave him $10 million. Non-refundable cash deposit. Non-refundable deposit on the company. And he's going to close, I think, in within six months with a price double what we we're offering. Okay, so... Do you so, remember what that price was? In no, days? I don't. Not okay. at this point. Yeah. So uh, he blocked us, and that's what he won, wanted to do. So, you know, we're sitting around and finally decided, instead of buying a company, moving it to Chattanooga, we're better off starting a company from the ground up. So we, we start the process to start the company. Uh, keep in mind, Bill Thiel had given us each $100,000 a piece. So we use that money as a way to start, which eventually became Covenant and US Express. The 50 trucks at USA Leasing, uh, David decides that he uh, is gonna start his own company and go, go a separate way. So he, he He's, it's, it's the three of you guys, David says, peace, I'm out. He, he says he's out, so, and that's okay, because uh, three people in a company, you know, we're trying to figure out how we could leverage a company fast enough to be able to afford three, three good salaries, and it, it's hard to figure out how to do that. So, so one bailing out kind of helped the numbers a lot. Did you keep the 50 trucks? You and Pat kept the we trucks? Took, well, the, how we divide the trucks, we had 25 trucks that we had financed for Southwest during that period when the deal was in process but not closed uh, called Lookout Leasing. So David took the Lookout Leasing trucks. We, uh, Pat and I took the USA Leasing trucks that were at Countrywide, which already had drivers, 
David had to go out and hire drivers. We didn't because uh, uh, we already had them. Uh, so that's that's where starting US Express's 48 trucks came from. Got it. Somewhere we lost two trucks in the process. <laughs> they just disappeared from the, <laughs> the legends. So you've got 48 trucks you're running. What happens with the Bill Phil Countrywide deal? It doesn't close. But, but keep in mind, we're, we're already launched US Express. So you've launched US Express. Covenant. So where does Countrywide end up? I'm curious. Okay, over, over a period of probably, I'm guesstimating, three or four years later, uh, CSX Railroad comes in and buys control of Countrywide. Well, Is Countrywide so, public at this point? No, wait a minute. Countrywide went public. Ah, My okay. dad took the information that we gave him to <laughs> take the, the company public when Phil didn't buy the company. And he decided to get to go see Larkin uh, and Bill Lag, and he ended up taking Countrywide public. But he's got ten more million dollars in his bank. Yeah, right. That yeah. he got out of the deal, and right. he's now taking it public. Right. Okay. So so they take it public, and I guess it's a couple, couple two or three years after they got public, that CSX Railroad comes in and buys buys the company. You know, and then then over a period of time, Countrywide gets in trouble and. It starts liquidating assets, you know, and this that's over about a six or seven years. Railroads period. have a horrible track record in owning trucking company. It's very different when you operate at a mid fifty OR than right. a company with a ninety five or ninety six OR. Well, if you go back and look at some of the most successful companies, what you said is true. North American Van Lines is probably one of the most successful companies, and you couldn't compete with them when they went into to a customer. They basically said. I'm going to give you a rate cheaper than anybody else, and when when I have a uh, need a load in that market, I want it. You know, so basically the rest of us just had to move over and let them take what they wanted, because uh, we couldn't haul as cheap as they they could, because they had some really really good paying head hauls. Mm -hmm. uh, so the rest were of they us, intermingling their household goods and over the road trucking? Yes, got it. Now they exited that market at some point. They did just because they, that model didn't work. Or? I think the model worked, but I think when the railroad bought them, mm. the railroad screwed it up. Got it. Who Union Pacific bought them? I think the Union UP. Pacific. So we're we're countrywide is now public. The railroads bought it, but meanwhile, you guys have gone out and started U.S. Express. Bill Phil is struggling to pay his debts and obligations. Southwest Motor Freight sort of uh, really really struggling. You're off on the races, right? Yeah, and, and actually, Bill Phil did us a great favor. Uh, when when he saw one of our trailers at one of his customers, he'd get he'd get upset and go pull his equipment out. So we would call customers and say, "Can we park a, a unit at your location over the weekend?" You now, know? Did they were they in on it? Did they know what was happening? Did no. they know he was going to? Oh, no. So, no. This is a way just to get him to. to so so we we basically park equipment at customers. And then somebody would call somebody at Southwest Motor Freight and tell them, tell them that that equipment was there. Next thing we know, we've automatically got a customer. So, <laughs> so you're trolling Bill <laughs> Phil, and he's he's getting pretty upset, pulling his equipment. You end up with the customer because the customer said, hey, you got right. a trailer here. And we had the long-term relationship with the customer too. You know, and that's relationships do, do make a difference in this industry. So at some point, as you went through the cycles, 86 or eight, late 85, 86, you guys start US Express, really building it. Um, and it scales really quick from, from those early days. We, we did a pro forma, five year pro forma, uh, took it to the bank, bank financed the company. And within the third year, we'd already executed through the fifth year. I mean, that's how fast the things scaled. Oil prices took one of the biggest drops the day we hauled the first load, and this may be an omen, the uh, day we hauled the first load, oil took one of the biggest drops it had ever taken. That same day, at which, man, our fuel, pro fuel prices were a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, of course, Yes Express. There's no fuel surcharge in those days, so this was direct right. cost. Right. Well, actually, there was in, in 86. Oh, okay. There wasn't back in the 70s. Got it. You know, but... Uh, uh, in 80, 86, there was. The fuel surcharges weren't that good. Yeah. But one thing that US Express had done when we first went in business, we're doing all kinds of aerodynamic stuff. We had electronic engine modules, which were very uncommon at that point. 
we're probably averaging four mile per gallon better fuel fuel mileage than most most of the industry. So the the fuel surcharges that were in effect for most of the industry, we were doing okay. Most of the industry was taking a twenty to thirty percent hit. Meantime prices went up. Now I remember as a kid, you your dad had cab overs. That was the <laughs> the white with the red line cab over was right. the thing. And then you ended up buying these long nosed trucks in those days, which is really what most modern trucking looks like, at least in the US. But I'm I'm curious, in those days it was not in vogue to buy long nosed trucks, right? Well, if you go go look at the length laws, you almost had to have a cab over truck. You know, and and as they were moving from 48 foot uh, trailer regulations to 53s, uh, people were trying to apply the mentality of the regulations, the old regulation, to the current, to the new regulations, which if you read it the way, way the old regulation would read, then you'd still have to have a cab over. So my, my dad and his company and my stepbrother, uh, and my dad bought another company uh, also along the way uh, called Jmart, but uh, in his company uh, and and also in Covenant, they they started buying cab overs so they'd be ready for when 53 foot trailers became legal. You know, and we we kind of had some insight maybe a year year and a half before, so a lot of people were going that direction. I had tested uh, the cab over versus the conventional and. Uh, the convention was so much safer, and drivers really preferred it. So, so I was resisting. When the 53-foot regulations came out, they were broad enough to where you could read it two or three different ways. Uh, so we basically read it the way that we wanted to read it, which basically said the conventional tractor and a 53-foot trailer would work because they were limiting the trailer length, not the overall length, uh, which had been, been the case before. Uh, so we went out and leased uh, from TIP or extra lease some 53 foot trailers and put them by, behind conventionals and ran them cross country. And I gave, gave the drivers an index card with my number, home number on it, and basically said, if you get stopped, call me whatever time, time it is because I want to talk to the officer. So I probably had two or 300 calls over over a few weeks and they were trying to apply the old law which is overall length as opposed to the trailer length so the new law at that point basically said the 53 foot trailer was allowed didn't say anything about the overall length where the previous law you had the overall length so i was highly successful doing 53 foot trailers with conventional tractors now how did the officer let them go was that I'd, I'd have them pull up the, the new law and oh, read it, read. <laughs> and it basically read trailer length, not overall. You know, and, and the federal law, in theory, superseded any state law. You know, in interstate commerce. So, so I was able to get every every state to go along with me, except for one, the state of Maryland. And so, so the fine was fifty dollars, and you know, it's, it's cheaper for us to pay the $50 fine and you know the few times we got stopped in Maryland uh, because the rest of the nation is letting us buy with it. Even California. Even California. California probably liked it because it was more aerodynamic. It was. Conceptually. It was. Well and, and at that time there was a little bit of stress in the market uh, about capacity so mm. this this field kind of backfilled the capacity. Those are the late 80s capacity issues? Uh, Probably late 80s, yeah. So you've seen a lot. I mean, if you think about deregulation in 1978, implemented in 1980, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think a lot of people forget that Carter, it was actually Carter's administration that approved the deregulation, right. implemented under Reagan. Um, but regardless of that, the the industry, you guys really got your, you got your start in 1985. Right. Uh, there was a new class of carrier. It was U.S. Express, Covenant, CFI was in that crew, mm -hmm. Celadon was in that crew. You guys were really, as a as a sector, the most profitable uh, related to trucking as a group. The most profitable, the long haul was really profitable. Right. But something happened in the late '90s where that long haul business complete, the dynamics completely changed. 
uh, if you, yes, it changed a lot. If you looked at our company, we had about 5,000 trucks running into Southern California, picking up freight, coming back to points east. Uh, and when is this? In the late, late 90s. And I can't remember, 97, 98, somewhere around there, the railroads were doing a lot of consolidation. So a couple of them bought each other and really went through a meltdown trying to merge the two railroads together. So a lot of freight got pushed over to trucks. And you thought that rail was totally going away. So, so there's a lot of growth in the industry from, from all those, those uh, the additional freight that, that had been picked up. And the railroads are trying to transition from box cars over into intermodal, but they really didn't have the intermodal model totally perfected. Hunt at that time was about the only one that really had the intermodal thing figured out. And the rail railroads themselves are still trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. It looked like the railroads were going through a meltdown in the late 1990s. Uh, so that pushed a lot of freight into, into trucking, which created a lot of additional capacity in the market. And that, that really kind of set us up for 2000, 2001 for, for a pricing downturn and a slight, what I call a recession. And, and this is really, industry. I mean, going from the late 80s, mid 80s, when you guys started all the way to the late 90s, it was growth. There was, mm -hmm. I mean, there was a couple of sort of soft cycles, but nothing really sort of demonstrative. But the mid two thousand or the early two thousands is really the first major downturn in long haul trucking that you guys saw. Well, most most of the industry is growing at twenty plus percent per year. I mean, it, you know, it really started nineteen eighty with deregulation, mm -hmm. you know, but it really took off in the late nineteen eighties. Uh, that's where you saw Hunt really start to get pretty successful. Uh, you saw most truck most truckload companies really kind of were coming into their own. I mean, Hunt was struggling in the 90s at, at one point. Uh, probably were, in the 80s. It was uh, the 80s, late 80s. And, they were, and they started getting their act together in the 90s, and they did their un intermodal deal, which, you know, they've done a great job with. Did you, when you saw the intermodal, because I've heard stories of, like, what Don Schneider said about railroads in those days. Mm -hmm. it, it, the, the orange box would never end up on a, on a rail. Yeah. The, the rumor, I don't know if that's true, but... Um, did you guys sort of have the same reaction of like, why would you put freight on the railroads in those days? No, actually, uh, you know, the railroads, I'll finish the story, the railroads going through their meltdown in the late 1990s. And it looked like the railroads were almost, you know, they were screwing up their customer base. The industry grew, the trucking side grew pretty strong in the late 1990s. We'd just done a uh, a hard acquisition of a company that had been bankrupt called PST Vans in Salt Lake. And we got to really, really studying what's going on. And we were so exposed into that long haul market, especially Southern, Southern California to points east, that uh, we decided we had to diversify. This is 1999, because the, if the railroads ever got their act together, we were at, at risk. Yeah, and so we had to pivot our business model. So we started that in 1999. Well, the railroads never really got their problem totally fixed, but when oil prices shot up in 2003, it didn't make any difference how bad their service was. The customers are gonna put it on intermodal. You know, so we saw, at that point, we saw a lot of business shift to intermodal. And we had decided at somewhere around 2002, that if, it, if there is a big shift, since we've got all these long haul customers, we'll go in and provide intermodal, be like J.B. Hunt, and we did. And that was trailer on flat car, was really right, your- Right, right, we, we're, we're still using trailers, so we had flexibility to move it either way. Yeah, and that, that ended up being pretty successful in the early stages. And then uh, we act, actually uh, ran into a problem where two, thing, two events happened. Uh, one is my people changed the pricing to the customer, uh, took took away the truck fuel surcharge and put on a rail fuel fuel surcharge. So what I had to put on truck, I was losing money, which was kind of a crazy deal to do, uh, but you know it, it happened. And then the railroads went in and gave us a almost 20% rate increase on the lanes that uh, we we weren't we were using. Uh, they gave us a discount on lanes that we weren't using, but gave us a big increase in lanes that we were using, which I can't go to a customer and get a 20% increase. 
increase. Yeah, you, the so, ones you're using are the ones you you don't need rate increases. That's right. And so it's like, well, great. Uh, uh, Seattle to L.A. is cheaper now, but it doesn't do any good. Yeah. So over about a six week period, uh, we took a pretty sizable, several hundred million dollar intermodal operation down to almost zero. Yeah, you because know, I wasn't going to make a profit. It was what mid mid 2010s. Uh, somewhere around that point. Gotcha. What, you, you think about now, U.S. Express, you've passed on the baton as CEO to mm -hmm. Eric. Right. Um, Which I haven't retired brother. yet. No, you're still there. You're, I, you're, I, I will retired. say you're still there. <laughs> um, I'm curious, when you pass it on to your son um, and you pass it on to someone, how does it feel as a founder having built a company and you're, you're it's no longer just your company. How do you feel about that as? Well, and you compound it by, by going public. You know, it's, it really changes, you know, my position a lot. You know, I used to want to get in the middle of almost everything, you know, and when you name somebody else the CEO, you no longer have that right. Same thing uh, when you go public. You know, one thing the public board wants to know, who, who's it really in control? And, you know, I had to get up and say, guys, this guy's the one in control. You're talking about Eric. Uh, talking about Eric, my son. This guy's really in control. I'm not. You know, is, and that, that somewhat hurts. Is it is it painful walking in and you can't make the day-to-day -day decisions that you did? Does that, does that bother you? I think a lot of decisions would be a lot easier uh, because I've got the experience. But sometimes you just people can't help themselves. No, I mean, as a founder, <laughs> it's difficult because your company, oftentimes, company is a representation of the founder. And it's true it in, is. in every company, even ones that have been as big as U.S. Express and are as big as U.S. Express, right. you still, you, your, your imprint is still very mm -hmm. much on that company. Right. Um, I'm curious, what has been the most rewarding part of that transition for you um, as you've gone through this transition to Eric being well, you know, you know, being one of my sons, uh, the hours I used to keep, you know, and where I'd get home seven, eight o'clock at night and still take phone calls at night. A lot of times bring stuff home and work, you know, through midnight after y'all went to bed. That really continued up until, till about six months after Eric took the position. And, and today I get off work about six o'clock. You know, and my wife basically says, I love this, you know, because <laughs> cause she used to uh, browbeat me, you know, your mom. I know. Browbeat I know me all for about being, it. being late, you know, and I had a lot of microwave dinners because it was cold by the time I got home. So uh, I'm uh, not going to comment. She, I'm not going to go. I, I get in trouble if I said something. She, she so. likes this new environment. So, yeah, for uh, sure. What is, um, so you got more time. What do you miss most of all? If there's one thing, one role that you had as CEO that, that was really something you loved that you don't get to do as much not being the CEO anymore, what, was, what do you miss most of all? Getting into the meetings with the management group and working through strategy uh, with the group and then coming to a decision and going executing. So you like the see, team, building your team, it was yes. your team, it was your people, right. and that's transitioned now to Eric's team in right. many ways. And, and Eric's done a great job really picking good people mm -hmm. you know so I'm, um, I'm proud of what he's done there but but I do miss you know getting in the action yeah no I, I as a founder I can certainly empathize with that I, I have a lot of that I mean, uh, thank goodness I've got multiple companies so I can dabble, go over there and dabble in each and one haunt, of them haunt them the, the <laughs> founders uh, the, the yeah. executive teams um, what's what's next for you what's what's next for me boy I you know, I guess at my age, I'm supposed to retire and go away, but I'm not. Uh, with By having multiple companies and, and having sons that are highly successful in their businesses, you know, it's being a part of what they're doing. You know, even, even your company, I uh, love what you're doing. You've got information here that this industry's never had. And the information that, that you are putting together is going to change this industry in ways that we don't even know today. Yeah, it's interesting. I think a lot of people assume that you fund, you help fund the company to no, start and no. do it. I, I joke, I say, when I went to you to raise capital, you told me you didn't have any liquidity. Before you expressed IPO, you didn't have the liquidity. And I that was probably, true. <laughs> probably you weren't ready to invest. 
um, because of you know having worked in one of the companies that you funded in the yeah. past, um, that uh, we didn't have the best outcome for you personally. You had a lot of money tied up mm -hmm. and a lack of liquidity. Um, and I think about the fact that you fired me was probably I the best you. thing that ever happened. It's probably the best thing ever happened because, you know, I took away the silver spoon and you had to go out and figure out how to make it on your own. And, and you know, initially, one reason I didn't want to invest because I wanted you to do it on your own. I want you to know that you made this happen. There's a difference if I had given you money, the seed money to get this thing started, or you going out and earning it on your own. Once you've done it on your own, you know you can do that. You got mm. you got to sustain this thing going forward. I can't do that for you. Yeah, for sure. And and we certainly have been blessed with great investors that have been supportive. And, oh, you've done and, a great job. And, yeah, uh, great a great team that's here and and all of it. Well, I'm really amazed at what you've done in a very short period of time. You know, it's, it usually takes companies ten to fifteen years to really get the kind of traction that you've gotten, and you've done it in. A, in Less than three years. I think a lot of that is just the speed at which um, business models are changing. Mm -hmm. I think certainly we've been a beneficiary of the trend, but I think broadly technology, social media has enabled companies like ourselves to really thrive. I mean, I think a lot of it's just timing. Um, and I think businesses operate really much faster than they used to. I think about your business and, and sort of where trucking is headed. Uh, you guys are, as a as an industry, under a lot of pressure for innovation because you have all these new upstarts. You have a lot of venture mm -hmm. capital that's in the industry. Right. Um, I'm wondering how does a, a, a large legacy company like U.S. Express really respond to those challenges? Uh, being, being kind of an old line trucking company, I can tell you we're innovating on a lot of fronts. Uh, I think things that uh, we're doing today is going to drive our company into the future uh, in a very successful way. You know, the, I think one, when I look at part of your success, you're venture backed. You're not, you're not a PE backed company. It's not a uh, stock, you know, stock public company. It's not it's a slash not, and burn and short term sort of thinking. Well, they think long term, they want, they want a big play. Well, venture capital things long term, and, yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, the problem with being public, everybody wants the next quarter to be your best. You know, and, and it doesn't always happen that way. And and when you make investments in the future, it gets gets tough sometimes. So how do you, I mean, how do you make investments in an environment where you have to be quarterly focused for in technology and innovation? You just can't go spend the big bucks to, to really push push the envelope like you can when you're venture back. Yeah, I mean, so, we're, we're, I think our investors are more, for, like if we made EBITDA but didn't grow, Right. It's a really bad thing for us because mm -hmm. I, I think it says, hey, there's so a lot of upside and opportunity in this business. You're you're sacrificing growth opportunities for short term profits. Right. And that mitigates their returns and frankly mitigates our opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's hard for a lot of established businesses, executives to understand because it's just a different way of doing things. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've learned over the years is there's different ways to finance a business. And if you get into what I call a high tech fast growing business, you don't have to venture money. You know, if you're going to be slow growing and more more stodgy, probably the stock market may be may be the place to be because they want to see the next quarter profit. Uh, it's a value play. Yeah, it's a value play. The the ones that are more exciting is what you're doing where where uh, it's about growth and it's about bringing new products and it's about pushing the envelope as hard as you can push it to to bring that growth along. And, and I think that uh, understanding that, a lot of people would probably choose your mode of financing versus uh, say going public or. I think if you can get venture growth, if you can get venture capital, you have a, you have to grow revenue. I think that's right. the thing that people don't understand is it's not just about entertaining investors and, and convincing mm -hmm. them that the business makes sense. I mean, metrics matter and numbers mm -hmm. matter and revenue matters. And the only way to get revenue is to have customers to buy your product. Right. And the only way to have customers to buy the product is A, to have a good product, and B, to have good commercial channels and and please them at every part yeah. of the cycle. And so that's something we invest a lot in, but it is uh, it is a very different world that I am have the opportunity to grow up in mm -hmm. than, frankly, than you right. have the opportunity to grow in. 
um, or had the opportunity to sort of spend in. Um, I wonder how your path would have been different if it were, you know, if what ha venture capital would have been available to you in those days. But who knows? I mean, it's a different well, world than time. As fast as we grew in the early days, we probably would have qualified for the venture group. They probably would have liked that. Yeah, because we're so. growing, growing at the pace of about 30 to 40 percent a year for probably the first almost 15 years. Uh, we were the fastest growing truckload company to get to to a billion and a half dollars and and did it in about half the time that any of you know, the rest of the guys did so so big big improvement but uh, you know back back to how companies are funded there's really four modes and it's private debt it's going public it's PE and it's venture yeah okay so sometimes people choose the wrong mode for their type of business you know you chose the right one for years and i think that uh you know i've got another company that's in the payments business i really think the venture side is it's it's way to be uh, be funded in the future i funded it with you know my own equity uh, which is probably the worst way to do it uh you know because we've had to grow a lot slower than than we could have otherwise uh same thing you look at yes express and what it's doing you know it's you know, is it going to stay a public company? Probably so. But, you know, is there is there ways that it can venture out to tap into some other avenues? Who knows? We'll see. Depends on the future. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot going on. Well, Dad, appreciate you coming on. Fuller speed ahead. Uh, we'll be back for more shows. Tune in to Freight Waves TV for Fuller Speed Ahead episodes. Also, if you haven't gotten your tickets for Freightways Live in Chicago on November 12th and 13th, be sure to get those. We're up 300% versus uh, we were at our last event, so we're expecting a ton of attendance. High energy, fast cadence, a lot of activity. It is the freight party of the year. We'll see you there. Do you know an innovative and disruptive tech company that is changing the freight industry? Or are you that company? Nominations are being accepted now through October 5th for the 2020 Freight Tech 100 Awards. Last year, Freight Waves received more than 500 nominations. The top 25 companies are recognized within the top 100. Winners are chosen by an amazing peer class of industry executives, investors, and academics. Being a member of the Freight Waves Freight Tech 100 and Freight Tech 25 is an amazing marketing and public relations opportunity. Last year's inaugural winners include companies like Tesla, Convoy, JB Hunt, Project 44, and Amazon. 2020 winners will be announced at Freight Waves Live Chicago, November 12th and 13th.